I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Noah Kaufman. Uh, I'm an economist and a research scholar uh, at the Center on Global Energy Policy within the SEPA School here at Columbia University. The founder of our center is Jason Bordoff. He was working on energy and climate change policy at the White House and found himself wishing that academic institutions were a bit more geared towards answering questions that people in his position needed answers to. So he did something about it. He created the Center on Global Energy Policy. Our mission is to enable public and private sector leaders to make more informed choices about the world's most pressing energy issues. The topic tonight is a perfect example of this. Sometimes when you work on climate change policy, it can feel like you're living in a fantasy world, especially with our current federal government. On the other hand, it kind of feels like we're in a moment right now in 2019. Never before have I felt like there was this degree of consensus that we need to take action uh, to confront the risk of climate change. And we've known for many decades that a price on carbon dioxide emissions is a critical part of the solution. How to put a price on carbon or how much to charge for each ton of carbon dioxide emissions is a lot less clear, even among experts. So tonight we're gonna to try to shine some light on this important policy design issue. We've imported the best possible speakers to help us do this, and they're sitting right here in front of me. Uh, here's how it's gonna go. We're gonna start with a presentation from Gilbert E. Metcalf, who is a professor of economics at Tufts University, where he holds the Don John DiBiagio Chair of Citizenship and Public Service. In addition, he's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He's frequently testified before Congress and served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment and Energy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. In that position, he was a founding board member of the, of the Green Climate Fund. His most recent book is Paying for Pollution, Why a Carbon Tax is Good for America, published by, by Oxford University Press in 2019. And we are selling copies of this book out in the lobby. So please, uh, please, please get one if you like what you hear. He received a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Tonight, Gibb is going to give an overview of his book and then focus in on approaches for setting carbon tax rates. After Gibb, I'm going to give a short presentation about ongoing work being organized here at Columbia on this topic of setting carbon tax rates. Then I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne Brooks, who's also in the front row here. Suzanne is the Senior Director of U.S. Climate Policy and Analysis at the Environmental Defense Fund. Her area of expertise includes U.S. federal and state climate policy, the economic impacts of climate change, and the design of carbon pricing programs. At EDF, she works to develop and advocate for environmentally responsible and economically sound policies aimed at reducing emissions. She earned a BA in economics from Colgate and an MPA in environmental science and policy from right here at SEPA. Welcome home, Suzanne. Suzanne is going to tell us about how to set carbon prices in ways that can help ensure emissions reductions and also tell us what's going on inside the heads of real life policymakers on this subject. Following Suzanne, we're going to have a panel discussion that includes questions from the audience. We aren't going to ignore you if you ask broader questions, but we're going to prioritize questions that stick to the topic of getting carbon tax rates right. Uh, this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policy's website in the coming days. For those of you watching online, thank you for joining us. Um, and as well as the people in the audience here, you can ask a question for the panelists using the hashtag CJEP events and our Twitter, Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Okay, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Metcalf. Great, thank you, Noah. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I want to thank Noah for setting this up and, and uh, uh, also thank uh, Jason, who's not here, but Jason and I worked together uh, at Treasury um, and he was, a, he was a, a, a really interesting colleague. In fact, we go back further. We actually did some writing before Obama was elected. We, we wrote a, a couple of pieces together. So I'm going to, as, as, as Noah says, I'm going to start out broadly by talking a bit about uh, the book that, that I, I published earlier this year and then, and then sh uh, uh, home in on the, on the specific question for this evening. Uh, my book is Paying for Pollution, Why a Carbon Tax is Good for America. And, I, and what I was trying to do is, is write a book uh, 
that uh, regular people could read as opposed to economists. So I, I, I uh, spent a lot of time trying to think about the research I'd been doing for the past decade or so and translating it into, into English. So uh, that's what I've done. The book uh, really starts with a discussion of what's the problem with climate change, what are the costs if we don't do anything, and then what is it about a carbon tax that appeals to economists, what are the alternatives, uh, and if you do want to go ahead and do it, if you're convinced by the end of Chapter 5 that, yes, we should definitely do a carbon tax, how do we actually do it? What do we do with the revenue? Uh, wh what are the design features? How do you deal with objections and so forth? And one of the issues I, I do talk about in the book is how do we set tax rates? And so that's the topic for tonight. So I start with a very particular example. Uh, this is Roxy Moore, who lives in southern New Hampshire. And in 2016, we had a, uh, a quite severe drought in New England uh, that led her, uh, her well to dry up. And so she, like many other New Englanders and people experiencing droughts in other parts of this country and other parts of the world, had to go collect water using jugs of some sort. And uh, it was just something really unexpected. Uh, so is this climate change? Is it just uh, a bad spell of weather? Of course, that's the problem with climate change. We don't know whether it's just a, a freak event or something, uh, uh, or something more uh, uh, sustained and persistent. But this is sort of the, the economic cost in human terms. Uh, we know that, that uh, temperatures have been going up over the last uh, 150, 170 years. This is a chart that on the vertical axis, each dot is a year, and the vertical axis is giving uh, increases in global temperature, uh, global mean temperature going from about uh, 13.6 uh, degrees centigrade in 1850 and rising over time uh, to roughly 15 degrees uh, Celsius in 2018. So we're seeing over a, a one degree increase in global mean temperature. And along the horizontal axis is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starting at, at, at uh, a little above about 290 parts per million in 1850, and now we're above 400 parts per million uh, today. So there's this clear correlation between increases in temperature and increases in, in, in uh, in concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it is that concentration of the stock of gases that creates uh, the problems uh, of increasing temperatures and more extreme weather. Uh, and of course, climate change is more than temperature. It is really extreme weather. This is a chart uh, data uh, put together by NOAA. They have a climate uh, extremes index that, that captures uh, uh, drought conditions, uh, heavy rain conditions, very high temperatures, very low temperatures, and creates an index. And in a normal year, this index would equal 20. And if you go back to 1910, what you see is that this index, the green line, is sort of a smoothing of the, of the individual uh, uh, bars, which are the actual numbers for each year. And what you see is that, that it sort of bounced around 20, uh, sometimes under, a little bit over. But what you see is that starting around 2000, it has been going up uh, rather sharply so that the, the years with the highest climate extreme indexes, uh, you know, the top years are for the most part in the, in, in the recent uh, 10, 15 years. So there clearly is a trend going on both in terms of higher temperatures and extreme weather. And we see this in terms of higher risks to businesses, uh, uh, PG&E in California declaring bankruptcy. Uh, this is a case in point. Uh, again, are those dry conditions in California due to climate change or is it just uh, uh, freak weather? Uh, you, you can never pin it down and say for sure, but it's pretty clear that the risks today from climate change are much higher uh, than they were uh, 30, 30 years ago or, or longer. So one of the things I wanted to do in the book is to ask, well, how do we actually get people who don't believe the scientists, they don't believe the models, do we just ignore them? Do we just call them names? Do we say you're, you, you don't understand, you're being willfully obtuse? Or do we somehow try to frame things in a way that might uh, get them to think about the problem? 
And here I think this is where the 17th century French philosopher René Pascal is kind of useful. So there's this famous wager that Pascal came up with called Pascal's Wager, which is he had to decide whether he should believe in God or not. And so we thought about it and said, well, uh, I could believe, and if I'm wrong, eh, I miss a few parties, I go to church when I didn't need to, eh, it's, it's not so great, but it's not a big deal. But if he doesn't believe and he's wrong, it's very costly. And so his conclusion was, I will believe in God. So the wager is really about thinking about the, the uh, uh, sort of the loss aversion for making the wrong decision, if you will. And I think this is uh, 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 an Oxford economist, Rick Vanderplug, uh, sort of has written a paper sort of developing this idea for climate change. And so the question that the skeptics might ask is whether we should believe these climate scientists and their models and the accumulating evidence we have, or is it just weather variability? And again, uh, they could choose to believe and, and we take actions in terms of developing infrastructure, moving to a fossil-free economy, and if we're wrong, it will be costly. There will be a hit to GDP. But uh, if we don't believe and we're wrong, we're going to have pretty significant uh, impacts around the world. And so following Pascal's approach, uh, Pascal would believe in uh, the climate scientists. So whether this is something that's persuasive for climate skeptics, uh, I don't know. But I think it's a, it's a way of thinking about the losses uh, when, when thinking about uncertainty, when we don't know, any, uh, don't know uh, definitively uh, what's, whether, whether climate change is inextricably linked to, uh, to our emissions. I think it is, but, uh, but uh, we don't even have to have 100% certainty to want to take pretty significant action, I think. Um, so Arthur Begu is the father of the carbon tax. He developed this idea back about 100 years ago in a book, The Economics of Welfare, where he developed this idea that if pollution is a problem, uh, then the way to resolve it is to put a price on pollution, to, to raise the price of goods that create pollution, and it's called the Baguvian tax in his honor, the idea being that we really want to align the private costs faced by firms with the social costs, which take into account the damages from pollution. And the, car, and the Pigouvian tax idea is to put an adder to the private costs to align those private and social costs. Now, if you ask Pigou today, do you prefer a carbon tax or a cap and trade system, uh, which, is, which is there's a perennial argument amongst economists as to which is better, I think if you were, to, if you were alive today, he'd probably say, eh, whatever. Either one of those is good. Nobody was talking about uh, cap and trade back in his day, but I think his essential point is put a price on the pollution and let the, and let the uh, invisible hand of the market guide us towards more efficient outcomes. I like to think that a carbon tax is a way for Adam Smith's invisible hand to have a green thumb. Um, now, you're sitting there thinking, yeah, this is an economist think, uh, talking. Noah has already talked about, uh, are we living in a fantasy world, uh, talking about carbon taxes? Are we just tilting at windmills uh, by, uh, by, by take, talking about this policy approach? And I actually think uh, that Winston Churchill is, is the right person to uh, think about in this context. Somebody uh, asked Winston Churchill at some point whether the Americans would do something that would be important, uh, you know, important for the world, important for Great Britain. And Winston Churchill responded, the Americans will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And I think we have tried everything else. We have put subsidies on clean energy. We have, we have tried regulations. We have tried standards. We have tried all kinds of things. I think we're really ready for the right approach, which is to put a price on pollution. And, um, and even Republicans are beginning to embrace this idea. And I put this up there not so much as to endorse the Climate Leadership Council's plan, which is a carbon tax uh, with a revenue refund to all Americans through this carbon dividend approach. You know, maybe that's the right approach, maybe it's not. But I think the important thing is, is that we are seeing uh, senior Republicans, not only Republicans who are not in Congress, but we're now seeing Republicans who are in Congress beginning to embrace this idea. And we'll see more of this, I think, a bit in, uh, in, in Suzanne's presentation. So I think there is some hope for optimism here. Uh, 
How do we design a carbon tax? I spent the last part of the book talking about that. And here, uh, this guy, I think, has a lot uh, to, to offer us in terms of advice. This is Willie Sutton, the bank robber. Uh, he was once asked why he robbed banks, and he supposedly said, though in fact he probably didn't, but uh, he was supposed to have said because that's where the money is. And if we take the Sutton rule, uh, then we want to start by taxing uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion. That gets us to about three quarters of U.S. emissions, and we can get about another five to ten percent, uh, pretty, pretty, in a, uh, pretty reasonably at, at fairly low cost with a carbon tax. The rest of these emissions, we're probably going to have to use other approaches uh, like regulations. There, there are certain emissions that are simply too hard to tax, and I talk about that in the book. Um, lastly, how do, we, how do we get there? Um, and I think there's been a lot of talk about the yellow vest movement in France and how this is somehow proof that carbon taxes are a bad idea because the rioting supposedly took place because of a, a modest increase in, the, in, a, in, a, in an existing, pre-existing carbon tax. And I think that's the wrong lesson to take from this. I think the right lesson is Macron made a number of changes, including cutting taxes on the wealthy, uh, increasing something similar to our payroll tax, which is a fairly regressive tax, as well as increasing a carbon tax without thinking about what do we do to address problems with rural transportation in areas where there are not many alternatives to using a vehicle. Uh, so there was no framework for thinking about how to, how to implement these kinds of changes. And the result is the policy incoherence led to, I think, pretty, uh, this considerable unrest. Um, what's the right way to do it? This guy had the right way, I think. This is Ronald Reagan, for those of you too young to remember him. Uh, Reagan in 1984 gave a State of the Union address where he called for fundamental tax reform, which to him meant lowering very high marginal tax rates. We had marginal tax rates up at 70 percent, uh, in some cases higher, and he wanted to bring those rates down. So he set forward a policy framework that he wanted lower rates and the same amount of revenue, which meant that you had to broaden the tax base. And that created guardrails for Congress in terms of how they had to go about the reform. It sort, of, it, it sort of created a boundary which focused the discussion that led to a fairly significant, one of the, I think economists call it one of the best tax reforms, the Tax Reform Act of 1986. So I think having a framework is quite important. My framework is uh, that a carbon tax should be revenue neutral, that whatever money comes in should go out, tax cuts, carbon dividend, infrastructure spending, uh, but you, we don't want to be growing government. Uh, uh, we, we don't want to conflate the issues of this, the appropriate size of government and, and climate policy. It's got to be fair. We, we, we want a progressive reform, and there are ways to do that uh, fairly straightforwardly. It should allow us to streamline policy, and I know that uh, CJEP has done some work on thinking about which, how we can streamline policy in a way with a carbon tax. And it, but it also has to cut emissions a lot. We need a really substantial, uh, uh, ambitious carbon price. We need the political uh, 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 ambition to get there. So with that, let me turn to the question of the night, and this is really what I'm, I'm talking about in Chapter 7 of my book, among other things, is how do we get the carbon tax rates, set them right? And I'm not going to give you an answer, but what I want to give you is sort of some thoughts on different ways of framing the question, and, that, and I'll leave that and then turn things over to the next speakers. Uh, one approach is the Begovian approach. Uh, figure out what the marginal damages, the incremental damages from, from releasing another ton of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, and increase the price of the fuels by that amount. That's the Begovian approach, set the tax equal to social marginal damages. It is economically efficient. Uh, uh, it, is, it is simple. It is using the power of the market to, to make change. The problem is we don't know. We, don't, we fundamentally don't know what the value, uh, what, the social, what the, the social cost of carbon, if you will, is. We have lots of estimates. What we include in those estimates varies. What we're able to include in those estimates varies. Uh, we're gonna get, we, we are getting better at estimating it. But this is a real problem if we think that the estimates vary by uh, an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 or greater. Uh, how, what, did, what, how, what good is this for politicians? So I think it needs to inform uh, uh, how we set a tax rate, but we can't rely on that alone. 
Well, another approach is to take a targeting approach and say, okay, we want to cut emissions by some amount, and what, what tax rates will get us there? Uh, the, the advantage of that approach is the politicians and the whole international climate uh, uh, negotiations are really focused around targets. If we think of, of the Paris Agreement, countries were, were submitting uh, emission reduction targets for 2030 or 2025, whichever year they chose. Uh, so it's sort of aligning the targets with what politicians are focused on. The problem is, how do we get those targets? Is, is it the right target? Uh, and how does the tax rate get us there? And one argument against a carbon tax is, well, you're just going to let uh, uh, polluters pay for pollution by, by paying through the tax. And uh, Suzanne's going to talk about this, but this has been something I've, I've worked on, which is how do we create a hybrid carbon tax that uses the power of the market and a carbon tax, but, but creates a mechanism that with, with a self-adjusting tax rate to make sure we cut emissions by the amount we want. I call it emissions assurance mechanism. There are all kinds of names. Uh, most of them are clunky. I think EDF has come up with a cooler name than mine. Um, the third approach is uh, we just need some revenue. Department of Treasury tells us we can collect somewhere on the order of $2 trillion over a decade net of losses and other revenues. And the advantage of that is uh, Congress, members of Congress can use that revenue for all kinds of, of cool things and you can get political buy-in for that. But we want to make sure we don't distract from our ultimate goal, which is that we really need to reduce emissions. So I think those are kind of, I, get, I guess where I come down at the end of the day is that we're going to be in terms of setting the tax right, we're trying to make this, set this balance between doing something that's reasonably efficient, it doesn't create too high a cost for the economy in terms of lost jobs, inefficient investments, and so forth, against the political reality that a carbon tax is no good if we can't enact it. So we need to, we need to think about the politics of it as well. And with that, I'll stop and turn it over to uh, Noah. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Gib. Uh, let me just pull up the presentation, but um, that was terrific. It's really an honor to have Gib here with us. Gib probably knows more about carbon taxes than anyone in the country, so very cool to have you here for this event. Uh, all right, here we go. So um, again, I'm Noah Kaufman. Um, I work here at Columbia, and um, I'm going to give a short presentation here about some work that we are doing on this subject. Um, or at least organizing. It's a collaboration with uh, Haywan McJohn at the University of Maryland College Park uh, and also Alex Barron from Smith College. Maybe the only harder thing there is to do um, than nudge policymakers forward on climate policy is to nudge the economics profession forward on anything. And we're trying to do both with this project. So it's going to be a fun one. And I will try to my best to give you a bit of an overview here. Um, so here's some background. The degree of consensus, um, really among economists and other experts, about putting a price on carbon uh, is kind of unbelievable. Economists across um, really the, 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 the spectrum agree it's a good idea. And yet, there really is no consensus at all about the rates themselves, the topic for tonight. So. Um, in my view, a big reason for that is a focus on this metric that uh, Gib alluded to called the social cost of carbon. So this is the Pigouvian approach that, that he describes. Uh, so what is the social cost of carbon? You can think of it as the damages caused by putting one more ton of carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere. So the reason that that's super useful to know is that if you just set your carbon tax rates equal to the social cost of carbon, what you're doing is encouraging emissions reductions only when they cost less than the damages caused by the emissions. It's brilliant. The problem is we can't calculate it. We can, but here's what we do, what, what, what we find when we try to calculate it. It's on, it's, it's, here, here's a table of um, various degrees of results. And um, the estimates are really precise. And, it makes sense that they are because uh, when you think about it, the amount of damages caused by carbon dioxide 
carbon dioxide stays up in the atmosphere for centuries, right? And the damages it caused depends on how many of its friends are up in the atmosphere with it, right? So to calculate this metric, what you have to do is project out the global economy, technologies, emissions for hundreds of years, take those, figure out what they do to all the changes in the climate, very uncertain, figure out what those changes in the climate do to the economy in terms of damages that they cause, including things like collapsing ecosystems and increased global conflict around the world. You know, these, th these are things we can't really put a price on necessarily, uh, but we try. And then the icing on the cake is you have to impose these sort of moral judgments like um, how much do we value people 150 years from now versus people 50 years from now? Or how much do we value um, you know, reducing small probabilities of really civilization threatening risks? Um, and there's no right answers to those questions. So it's really no wonder that when we make these calculations, as Gib mentioned, they're not precise at all. So um, you know, literally from around zero to over $1,000 per ton. Um, and there have been some attempts to sort of narrow the range and get rid of outliers, but we're still talking about like an order of magnitude difference. Uh, so these are like drastic differences in climate policy stringency. The upshot is these estimates are useful to a policymaker if your goal is to justify a given carbon tax rate. They are not so useful if you want help setting your carbon tax rates. And that's the question um, that, that we're trying to answer with our project. So that kind of begs the question, what do we want in an approach to help policymakers set carbon tax rates? And I'm proposing three ideal attributes of that, of that approach here. Number one, you do want to balance the benefits and costs of emissions reductions. Number two, you want to create carbon price estimates uh, or carbon prices that are precise enough to actually help policymakers select tax rates. Hard to say what that is, but I think it's clear that what it isn't is what I showed you a minute ago with the social cost of carbon. And then the third thing is, you want these carbon prices to be consistent with the objectives of the policymakers. So um, again, on what that doesn't mean, and, and I promise I'll stop dumping on the social cost of carbon after this, but I wanted to show you this one slide from uh, Bill Nordhaus, who's an economist at uh, Yale, brilliant economist who basically pioneered this whole field of climate economics, um, and won the Nobel Prize in large part for developing these models that produce social cost of carbon estimates. And here's part of his presentation uh, when he won the Nobel Prize. He showed, here's what my social cost of carbon estimates are associated with in terms of temperature change. And what you can see is that the optimal temperature change coming out of his model is, for, is keeping temperatures to 4 degrees Celsius uh, in the 2100 to 2150 time frame. So not even weighing in on the merits of that, I have never come across a policymaker who says, you know, it, maybe some of them just want to put a price on carbon to put a price on carbon, but typically what you hear is you want consistency with two degree target of the international community, maybe the 1.5 degree target, a net zero uh, target to stop global warming. Um, so this is very clearly inconsistent with that. So I think what's happened is by going back to these three attributes, by focusing on that first attribute and attempting to perfectly sort of balance benefits and costs, um, we've kind of left policymakers without prices that satisfy the second and third attribute. So the question we're asking with our project is how can we do better across all three of these attributes, which are kind of are arguably all equally important. And our proposal uh, we are calling near term to net zero carbon prices taking suggestions on the name still. So four easy steps to set near-term to net zero carbon prices. Number one, you select a net zero emission state. And net zero is important. So net zero carbon dioxide, that basically means the sources of carbon dioxide are balanced by the sinks. So sinks being plants and trees and other things that suck in carbon dioxide. Um, you get to net zero, you stop global warming. So it's not purely a political target. If you think global warming is bad, 
Eventually, we have to get to net zero. Policymakers can be informed by the science and other factors to figure out how quickly we have to get there. Step two, map out an emissions pathway from today to net zero at the chosen date. That one's easy. Step three, you estimate the carbon dioxide prices that are consistent with the desired emissions pathway in the near term. So we have these models that are capable of saying, we increase the cost of carbon dioxide, of course, we use less of it, we switch to cleaner fuels, um, emissions go down. To what degree the models are okay in the near term in terms of predicting that, we think, and the further out you go, the more uncertain that becomes. So that's why the near term focus here is important. What we don't want to do is try to figure out what the carbon dioxide prices are to get to all the way to net zero, because then we start basically, you know, our answers are going to be based on our predictions about technologies decades from now. And there's no need to do that because we have step four here, which is adjusting the carbon prices periodically to make sure you stay on your emissions trajectory. And Suzanne's going to talk a lot more about um, this, this fourth step here. So uh, I guess one more thing about this is that I don't want to make it seem like we've invented this approach because hopefully if you're familiar with this subject at all, it seems kind of intuitive that you would want to set carbon prices this way. And in fact, if you look at jurisdictions or countries out over the world that are taking this issue seriously, places like the United Kingdom, this is roughly how their policy framework looks. Uh, what we're trying to do is formalize this and hopefully provide some practical help in terms of the carbon prices that a place like that needs. So as part of that, um, what we've done is start to estimate the near-term to net zero carbon prices for the United States. Um, and we're doing that in a model called, uh, it's called the GCAM model. It's run out of the University of Maryland. Um, so what we've done, roughly, is to take three potential net zero target dates, 2040, 2050, and 2060. And we use this model, GCAM, to estimate, basically to say what happens, we put in place one of these carbon taxes, uh, what happens in the 2020s um, to get on a straight line pathway from today consistent with that net zero target that you've chosen. So that produces our CO2 prices that we're looking for. That's kind of our benchmark case. And then what this approach lets us do is sort of um, hone in on uncertainties that are sort of very practical and real um, that affect, that first of all, that, that, that are legitimately uncertain, we don't know the answers to, and second of all, affect the carbon prices that we have to set to reduce emissions by different amounts. Uh, so a couple examples, technological progress. The faster clean technologies advance, the lower the carbon prices we need uh, to hit any emissions target. And then the other thing I'll mention is actually the last bullet point there, which is other policies. There's really no reason to think that the carbon price is the only policy that you want affecting emissions. Um, we have lots of other, you know, economists would call them market barriers, but really they're reasons emissions are clean technologies are not replacing dirty technologies. So, for example, uh, we're not all switching to electric vehicles, not just because electric vehicles cost more, but because we don't have the infrastructure in place uh, across society uh, to sort of facilitate that switch. Same is true in terms of efficiency policies. There's a lot of behavioral reasons we don't um, sort of maximize our energy or, or, or sort of optimize our energy efficiency, uh, aside from just sort of the price of the light bulb or keeping it on. And then air pollution, I think, is pretty intuitive, too. Um, you know, Coal power plants, for, for example, cause a lot of local air pollution um, that I think we all agree we should be cracking down on to some degree or another. Those policies also reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So the extent to which uh, we you know, reduce the use of coal for, re for these other reasons, that affects the carbon prices we need too. So as it turns out, that actually, that last bucket, I, I, I explain that in more detail because it ends up creating um, a lot of our range. So, I'll show you some preliminary results that we've found. And um, we haven't published these yet, so don't draw any firm conclusions from them. Uh, don't go putting them in your policies. I trust you guys. Uh, but I want to show them to you anyway. And uh, I'll show sort of three slides here for the 2040, 2050, and 2060 pathways. Uh, so 
Here is what we found for sort of U.S. carbon prices needed to get on a pathway to net zero by 2040, um, you know, uh, consistent with those other assumptions I mentioned earlier. And what we find is you need prices in the roughly $70 range by 2025 and the $100 to $150 range by 2030. So this is kind of consistent with the high end of the range of proposals that you see in Congress right now. There's a proposal from Representative Deutsch in the House, from Senator Coons in the Senate, that look a little bit like this pathway. Then let's look at net zero by 2050. So this is roughly where the Democratic Party uh, is at these days. You hear a lot of presidential candidates talking about net zero by 2050. You have a little longer to get there, so the carbon prices you need fall. So carbon prices in the sort of $30 to $40 range by 2025, in the $50 to $90 range by 2030. Then if we look at 2060, uh, so net zero by 2060, this is roughly in the range that the Obama administration was talking about in terms of its long-term uh, targets of 80% reductions by 2050. Other, developing, other developed countries have agreed to the same. Smaller carbon prices still. So in this case, prices in the maybe $10 to $30 range in 2025, uh, rising to say the $20 to $60 range in 2030. So uh, again, and you know, the uncertainty bars, um, you know, if, if, if you look at sort of the bottom um, shading there, um, basically what this is telling you is that if you push really hard on some of these other policy levers that, that I mentioned before, the carbon price is still important, but you really don't need that high of a carbon price to get on an emissions trajectory consistent with a 2060 net zero pathway. Okay, so I'm almost done, but just some takeaways here. Um, in terms of the benefits of this approach, uh, I would say, number one, we just think this is very policy relevant. We think this will be useful to policymakers who want to include a carbon price in their overall climate uh, policy strategies. Um, and then number two, if you think back to the, cr those criteria I showed you for what we want out of an optimal carbon price, uh, we think it satisfies this crit criteria um, a lot better than the other approaches. It, it, it produces at least somewhat precise estimates, it's consistent with policy objectives, and arguably it balances benefits and costs at least as well as these other approaches that are producing, um, you know, four degree Celsius outcomes. Second thing, a lot of times you hear this narrative that carbon taxes are useful, but they have to be so high um, that will never, you know, practically speaking, uh, they'll never be high enough uh, to actually cause the emissions reductions that we need. And on this front, what we're showing is that the prices that we're finding, at least in our preliminary results, are pretty consistent with the proposals that are out there in Congress right now. So this is good news. Caveats to keep in mind, I showed you some preliminary estimates from the United States using this approach. Every jurisdiction will have uh, somewhat different optimal CO2 prices. Um, and then the last thing, I mentioned the preliminary results before. Really, even if these were final results, you probably shouldn't trust them. Um, this model that we use is terrific, uh, but all these models, of course, are just simplifications of reality. Policymakers should look across models, see what kind of robust results that they find, uh, but trusting one is a bad idea. So part of what we're trying to do with this project and why I'm so excited to talk to anyone who will listen about it is that we're trying to convince other people to sort of do the same and, and kind of create a uh, movement of net zero, near term to net zero carbon price estimates. Um, with that, thank you very much and I will turn it over to Suzanne. Hi, everyone. Okay, thanks so much, Noah, and thanks to Columbia uh, and CJEP for organizing this panel and for having me. Uh, as uh, Noah said, um, I spent a couple years here at SEPA getting my master's, so it's really fun to be back, so thanks for having me. Um, uh, so I'm Suzanne Brooks. I'm the Senior Director of U.S. Climate Policy and Analysis at Environmental Defense Fund. Um, for those of you who don't know EDF, I'll just say a couple words about who we are and what we do. 
Um, we are a nonprofit, non governmental organization. We have nine offices around the country, three internationally. Um, we have two and a half million members, as well as over 700 staff, um, lawyers, economists, scientists, policy experts, and various other kinds of professionals. Um, and we work to develop and advocate for innovative and practical solutions to some of the world's most pressing environmental problems, including climate change, um, with a focus on market-based policy. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about what we're calling climate backstops. Um, as mentioned previously, there's lots of different names for these things. Uh, Gib uh, talked about emissions assurance mechanisms. There's lots of other names as well. Um, but basically, we're talking about hybrid carbon tax programs um, with adjust adjustment mechanisms, specifically um, provisions that are built into legislation that tie a tax to specific emission reduction goals uh, and then increase the price automatically if those goals are not being met. Um, and this is designed to help reduce emissions uncertainty um, or uncertainty over emissions outcomes. So, see if I can, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna try to make three main points today. The first is that these kinds of climate backstops or tax adjustment mechanisms are really an important component um, from our perspective in, in carbon taxes on, on policy grounds. Secondly, that these mechanisms are also likely to be an important element of any politically successful carbon tax in the US. Uh, and that three, um, as Noah mentioned, um, these kinds of mechanisms are really gaining traction in, in carbon tax proposals on the Hill and, um, and in other places as well. So first off, why, um, why adjust the, the tax in the first place? Why do we care about emission certainty? Uh, and I think there's a few reasons. The first is sort of a simple fundamental reason, which is that climate change is, is fundamentally a quantity problem. It's a problem of the quantity of emissions in the atmosphere. Um, and with this in mind, and given the inherent uncertainty associated with pollution reductions um, that result from a carbon tax, it simply makes sense to be tying your policy to pollution reduction goals rather than sort of setting a price and walking away and hoping that the tax sort of does the job. You want to be building in kind of provisions directly into the policy to make sure that your emission goals are met. Um, second, uh, I would say that there's reason to believe that hybrid policies can be superior to sort of pure taxes or pure caps. Um, so just as in a cap and trade program, um, you can have a price collar that helps to reduce uh, price uncertainty. Um, you can have these kinds of uh, tax adjustment mechanisms in a carbon tax to help um, increase emissions certainty. Um, and in both cases, these hybrids basically are kind of merging the strengths of, of caps and taxes together. And then third, this is something that Gib mentioned as well, um, international alignment. So international climate agreements are structured around quantitative emission goals. Um, and so tying a carbon tax to specified emission reduction goals helps align your legislation with the framework and expectations that are established by the Paris Climate Agreement. Okay, so secondly, um, I think it's also true that a hybrid program is more likely to be politically successful in the US. Um, and this, ba this rests on the basic premise that there's two main interest groups um, that are gonna be critical to passing US climate legislation. The first is regulated entities, regulated industry, and the second is environmental stakeholders. Um, and these kinds of hybrid programs can really help balance the concerns of these groups, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and it's really political economy considerations, in fact, that really primarily explain the prevalence of price, sort of parallel cost containment, price containment provisions in existing emissions trading programs um, in the US and around the world. And for similar reasons, um, we believe that a US carbon tax is likely to include these climate backstops um, as well. So taking a closer look at that, uh, in terms of cap and trade programs, um, both in the US and around the world, uh, in California, in the Northeast, where you have the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, which covers electricity in 10, in 10 states, you have provisions like price floors and allowance reserves. Uh, and in California, there's gonna be a price ceiling that's implemented in 2021. 
Um, so these are all kind of uh, price-based provisions that are designed to limit price uncertainty in these programs. And the reason is really um, concerns with a pure quantity-based approach. And so industry has concerns about high allowance prices, and so that's led to price ceilings in some of these programs. Environmental stakeholders really care about uh, environmental assurance. They've supported price floors in many of these places. Um, and so, you know, while neither group is monolithic, it tends to be the case that industry is going to care about lim limiting costs and price certainty, whereas environmental stakeholders care about um, emissions outcomes. And so hybrid programs can kind of balance the concerns of both of these, these groups. So turning specifically to um, tax adjustment mechanisms in the context of a carbon tax, I think there's a few reasons that um, those are likely to be part of a politically successful carbon tax in the U.S. The first is that it can attract broader support from the environmental community. So um, uh, environmental stakeholders can often be skeptical of carbon taxes. Um, sometimes that has to do with performance and questions about emissions outcomes. Sometimes that has to do with politics. Um, and climate backstops are not going to solve all of those problems, but it does help in terms of making the case that there's sort of a, a backstop mechanism or insurance policy in case the tax isn't achieving its goals. Um, it's also the case that I think environmental groups recognize that there's an important strategic benefit uh, in talking about these mechanisms in the sense that you're really focusing a negotiation around environmental performance. And so the more you are talking about <laughs> how ambitious do you want your policy to be, how, you know, to what extent do we want to save the planet, rather than um, what, do you, what are you willing to pay and what are the costs going to be, can have an, an, uh, an impact on sort of the, the outcome, can have a strategic impact on the outcome. And so I think environmental stakeholders recognize that. How you frame the conversation is important. And secondly, um, these provisions can play an important role with respect to the interaction of new legislation with EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gases. So industry, conservative groups, some academics have proposed that EPA regulations on GHGs be eliminated uh, if there's new legislation that's put in place. That's been met with pretty fierce opposition from many environmental groups. Um, and in a sense, you can think of EPA regulations as the environmental community's sort of outside option if we think about climate legislation as sort of a bargaining game. Um, and so in, it, in order to gain those stakeholder support, you're really going to have to be able to prove that this trade is going to lead to equal or greater uh, environmental benefits than it would otherwise. Um, and so these backstop mechanisms can play a role there as well. And third, um, without these kinds of backstop mechanisms, a higher carbon price is really the only means of providing sufficient assurance to some environmental stakeholders um, that you're going to meet your reduction goals. And a higher price is obviously going to be more difficult to pass politically. And so it may be the case that including these kinds of mechanisms would allow you to have a lower price path uh, initially, um, which might help ensure against of environmental performance risk while reducing political risk as well. So my third point is just to illustrate that there's um, a lot of momentum on the Hill around carbon pricing right now. And there's also a lot of momentum around these kinds of provisions, um, and they've been included in, in multiple bills thus far. So. This, these are all of the carbon pricing bills in the 115th Congress, as well as the bills introduced thus far in the 116th. Um, you'll see that actually in both cases, we have seven carbon pricing proposals. Um, this shows both the cap and trade and carbon tax proposals. Um, in both cases, six of the seven bills here are carbon taxes. Um, and you can also see that many of these include these kinds of tax adjustment mechanisms. So. <clears throat> First, we saw in the 115th Congress from uh, Republican Representative uh, Carlos Curbelo, who introduced uh, his carbon pricing bill uh, last summer, the Market Choice Act, uh, also included a, a tax adjustment mechanism, as well as uh, the bill led by Representative Deutsch that Noah mentioned earlier um, as well. That was reintroduced in the 116th Congress in January, 
And then there's been a couple of other bills from uh, Senator Coons as well as um, Representative Rooney. All of these bills include different forms of tax adjustment mechanisms. Now, I will also say that <laughs> all of these mechanisms look very different. The design choices that they have made are very different. Um, they you know, differ in the magnitude of the, the adjustment. They differ in terms of frequency of the adjustments. Um, but the fact that the sort of core concept of tying your tax to specific emission reduction goals and including these kind of in automatic increases has really kind of become uh, embedded in the, the, you know, the, the serious discussion around carbon tax policy on the Hill. And we can see that illustrated here. There's also, uh, Gib mentioned the Climate Leadership Council, a Republican group that's also put out its own specific carbon tax proposal that hasn't been introduced on the Hill yet, but is online and you can read about it there. Um, they've also talked about um, including a mechanism like this, an emissions assurance mechanism, they call it. Um, so, yeah, lots of momentum. And then finally, just a few concluding thoughts. So, I think it's worth noting that, you know, and this, is, this was clear from Noah's presentation especially, that establishing any climate policy objective comes with some uncertainties. Um, that the precise link between uh, emissions and temperature, the economic uncertainties about cost, um, the appropriate share of reductions that each country should take on in order to meet our global goals, there's lots of uncertainties there. Um, and so we need to be thinking about legislation that is, is both durable but also flexible in the sense that um, we need to be able to adjust over time um, given our sort of changing understanding about, about climate and what's needed um, to be achieved. So I think that these automatic mechanisms help with that, but we also need to be thinking about broader regular reviews of these policies and their, these specific provisions included in them over time. The second thing I'll say is that we need to do more research on these kinds of mechanisms. Um, as, as these ideas have been embraced on the Hill, um, you know, uh, staff have to grapple with a host of very practical questions about how to design these things. So how often should a tax, should a tax adjustment be triggered? How big should it be? Should it be based on annual or cumulative emissions, um, et cetera? And so you know, as they're grappling with those questions, we need to be thinking about what are the trade-offs in terms of environmental performance and cost of making those different design decisions, and that needs to be informed, it should be informed by you know, rigorous analysis. There's some work going on at Resources for the Future uh, in DC on exactly this issue, but um, this is still a relatively nascent area of research. Gibb was the first person to be talking about these mechanisms in 2009, so way ahead of the curve, um, but there's a lot more to do and a lot more research to be done. And finally, just uh, to reiterate my final point that um, you know, these kinds of climate backstops can really play an important role on policy grounds um, and can really help keep a program on track for meeting its goals. And uh, they're very likely, we think, to be included in a politically successful carbon tax in the US as well. So with that, I will finish and turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. That was great. Um, and thank you all again for coming. I'm, I'm really excited how many people came to nerd out with us on carbon tax policy design tonight. This is awesome. Um, so can, can everyone hear me? Can't tell if this is on. OK, great. Um, so again, for those watching at home, my name is Noah Kaufman. Uh, I'm here with Suzanne Brooks from the Environmental Defense Fund and Gilbert Metcalf uh, from Tufts University. Uh, we're talking about setting carbon tax rates uh, I'm going to kick off a uh, discussion here and then open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, for those here in person, when we turn to the audience for questions, just raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, for those watching online, you can use the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy to ask a question. Uh, so let me start with a question that puts Gib on the spot. Um, you sort of implied that there was no right way to set carbon tax rates, uh, but you literally wrote the book on carbon taxes, so your opinion is worth more than most people. So, so how would you do it? Let's say the next president says, uh, Dr. Metcalf, uh, set a carbon tax for me. H how would you do that? 
So uh, as I, as I, uh, so I think this is really a question of optimal reform rather than optimal design because we actually have a carbon price in place. We have a policy in place. The policy is that we have a zero price on emissions. So we're really talking about shifting the price. And so there's in interesting work by uh, uh, Princeton economist Avinash Dixit from a number of years ago on how do we think about uh, optimal reform paths. So in, in, in sort of thinking about this as a reform uh, uh, process, we need to get on the escalator. We need to go from zero to something. And so we could use the uh, Obama interagency social cost of carbon estimate, which is roughly $50 a ton, if you take sort of the central estimate, as a focal point and start with that. And a lot of the proposals do that. Uh, and then you can begin to sort of massage it when you, when you begin to think about the politics. One of the nice things I, I, I liked with Suzanne's uh, discussion of hybrids is that you get this political trade-off that with, with a tax adjustment mechanism or a, a climate backstop, you can, you can lower the rate a little bit initially, but with a higher growth rate. So maybe the lower rate initially allows you to get on the escalator, but then the escalator is going up fairly rapidly. Uh, 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 so I think you know, you're really having to balance the, uh, the politics and, econom and economics of it. He didn't choose my approach. Did you, did you notice that? <laughs> it's okay. I'll win you over eventually. Um, any, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, well, I would just – is this on? I think she's yeah. really tall. Um, I guess I would just say that I, I do really like your approach, Noah, um, unsurprisingly. <laughs> I like uh, it, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blushing. Um, I mean, on, on Gibbs' sort of list of three uh, options for, for how to set prices, uh, you know, unsurprisingly from my presentation, I, you know, we believe and, and I believe that um, we really need to be thinking about emissions goals and tying these programs to emissions goals in the first place. So the idea that, that you guys are sort of looking specifically at reaching net zero and also looking at the... Um, you know, what's needed in the near term and then adjusting over time, I think that makes a lot of sense and is uh, very aligned with a lot of what um, I was saying earlier. So, so I do want to push back on the net zero a little bit, only in the sense that uh, net zero by 2040, 50, 60 uh, is net zero, if the cost of getting to net zero versus a 95% reduction is to increase cost by a factor of 10 because the last part is really, really expensive, do we want to go there? And I think that's where uh, the estimates of, of marginal damages is, is, is a useful exercise for economists to be doing to help inform that discussion of do we, is, is net zero the right number by mid-century or is, is really getting close to the right answer? And I don't know what the answer is, but I think uh, the economics can help us there. Do you think the, the the estimates of marginal damages give us that answer, though? Well, I think the modeling that you're doing, so you, you ended your, your uh, discussion by, s your presentation by saying, we need a whole bunch of modelers to do this. So you could, for example, propose to the Energy Modeling Forum that they do an exercise on this, and that'd be something I would recommend you consider doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that would help you, you could, you could play with these sorts of things. Say, well, what if we get to, uh, you know, uh, 5% of 2005 emissions. What is that? What is, what is the cost of that? So question for Suzanne. Um, I wanted to ask you about political constraints because you're in and out of policymakers' offices all the time. So for policymakers who are interested in carbon taxes, uh, sometimes you hear that um, we need lower taxes because um, higher taxes give them heartburn. So I'm curious, from your perspective, um, are there political constraints on the levels that we can set for carbon taxes in, in policymakers' minds? And if so, what are they? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are political constraints on that, but I think uh, I'm not sure what they are, and I think that anyone who tells you what they are doesn't really know. Um, if, as you pointed out, I think um, there's a wide range of proposals that have been put on the table. Um, you know, I, I put up a bunch of uh, bills on, on my slides. They have, there is a wide range of price paths included in those bills. Um, very different uh, levels of ambition. 
So I think it's very hard um, to say what's sort of the right answer to that question. And I think that there's other equally important political constraints that people are thinking about or political considerations that people are thinking about um, that have to do with how a program is designed. It's not just about the price, it's about what is it gonna achieve from an emissions perspective, but also is it gonna be designed to be equitable? What are you gonna do with the revenue? Um, all of those things I think are extremely um, relevant to the political conversation and it's not, people are not just looking at the price path as sort of the constraint on what's possible. Gib, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think Suzanne sort of captures uh, a lot of the points. I guess I'd have a kind of a follow-on question for the political expert here, Suzanne, which is that to what degree do you think the revenue potential from a carbon tax is helpful in Congress? Oh, I think it's very helpful. I think it's very helpful. I, I mean, I think that you get a ton of revenue even with a lower carbon price. Um, so I'm not sure how much that informs sort of the level of the price and whether that um, you know makes much of a difference if we're talking about a you know a thirty dollars starting price or a fifty dollars start starting price. There's still a lot of revenue you're going to be raising, um, but certainly yes, I think that's a huge um, political benefit. Um, yeah, and certainly the the ability to use the revenue to um, at least some of the revenue to counteract the changes in energy prices is I think important. You see it in all the bills that, that you had up on the screen there um, and kind of unique to carbon pricing compared to other policies that don't, don't generate that revenue. Yeah. But we don't want to counteract the energy prices directly, do we? <laughs> don't we want the price signal to, to, to tell people we should use less fossil fuels? Well, what, what we want is not to make people poorer, obviously, yeah. right? We want to change the relative prices so that, it, so that the uh, high carbon options are, are less attractive than the low carbon options. Right. Is that the right way to put it? Yeah, I think so. We want to think about how we can give the revenue back in a way that doesn't undo the price signal there. Mm -hmm. So why don't we open it up to the audience? Um, we have any questions in here? Why don't, why don't we start <coughs> right here in the front? I, I have uh, two quick, uh, two quick questions, simple question. First question is, uh, you, if you want to uh, do the carbon tax, how about the the people just pass on the cost to the consumers. Um, the second question actually make right to your, to, your, to your point, what's the right price? If I'm not allowed to pass the cost to the consumers, what is my cost? I can do, you know, for the most uh, emitters, we know how much it costs to do the carbon capture, which is maybe three to $50. Uh, on plus of the fifteen dollars mm -hmm. injection, so I have exact price. It's a very simple calculation, simple math. All right. Anyone? Gib, do you want to take that? So, so on the issue of of one company just pass the price forward to consumers. The the reality is the way markets work is sure they'll try to. But consumers have options, and so they can step away from a product that's a, a, a carbon-intensive product towards a, a, a product that has lower carbon intensity, and they'll just buy less of it, in which case what that means is then is if the firms can't raise their prices and market forces dictate that, then they'll either have to cut wages, so the, the workers in those industries are affected, or their profits go down, so the, 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 uh, the owners of capital are affected. And in fact, the studies that have been done show that yes, prices will go up, but in fact, prices go up more for those carbon intensive goods, so you do get that substitution we're looking for. But we also see that uh, work by, by Larry Goulder at Stanford and Mark Hafstead at, at Resources for the Future, and others have seen this, shown this as well, is that what you really see is that, well, wages may go, you know, workers are affected a little bit, but actually owners of capital are even affected more. So it's actually a progressive element to, the, to a carbon tax is when you look at factor prices. Other questions? Um, yeah, why don't we take a couple, actually. So, so here and here. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll get you both. Um, so I, I guess I have a, a question that's more politically focused. Um, you know, just looking at the, the uh, last six years of the Obama administration, um, I'm a little um, reluctant to, to think that Republicans could compromise on any sort of carbon tax bill going forward in the Senate. Uh, 
Um, and you know, just looking back to uh, the 2009 cap and trade bill as well, the biggest hindrance to that uh, in the Senate um, was blue dog Democrats. So they seem uh, like an important you know, sort of coalition to, to look at for actually passing a carbon tax. Um, what do you think is a good way to maybe get them on board um, with any sort of price target for a carbon tax? And why don't we gather just a couple more questions um, and then just respond in a bunch, just because I see there's a lot of questions. So we had here and, and one there. Two questions. Uh, the first is, instead of letting the uh, government determine the price, what is the idea of setting carbon emission permits, determining what your goal for emissions is for that year, and then auctioning off those permits by the government at the beginning of the year? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, it's a global consideration. If you don't get other countries to go along, and you're faced with the prospect that we are the only ones and a few others who are doing it, but you're not achieving goals sufficient to gain the overall climate objectives, what should policy then be domestically in terms of carbon taxes? Okay, why don't we stop there? Otherwise, we'll, we'll forget them. Um, you guys want to weigh in on, on, on any of those in particular? Uh, I can try on the political question, um, although it's very hard. Uh, I will say that... Um, so we, we at EDF do think that there is a path forward for meaningful climate policy under a new administration, a new Congress in 2021. It is a very narrow path in the Senate, for sure. Um, and there's a number of different, um, both Republicans and uh, moderate Democrats and sort of interests that are gonna need to be carefully taken into account. Um, some of those are sort of ag-focused uh, states. Others are focused on labor. Uh, you know, there's lots of different um, particular issues that, that those folks care about. Um, so, you know, we're trying to think about what are, the, um, what are the sort of policy mechanisms that you could imagine building into a comprehensive piece of climate policy that could, um, you know, help gain the support of those, those folks. That might be in terms of revenue, it might be in terms of other things, but um, it's, it is a very narrow path, but I think that um, you know, uh, it's necessary for us to, to try, and so we are working on it. The only thing I'd add to that is that I think uh, climate activism is enormously important, so the Sunrise Movement, uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby, Climate Exchange, these are extremely important citizen efforts to push the debate forward. You know, as an economist, I know nothing about lobbying or, or you know, people power, but, it's, but I think it's gonna be extraordinarily important to push, this, to push this forward. Yeah, and I'll also just add that, um, you know, we are seeing Republicans taking steps forward. We saw Representative Curbelo last year with the Market Choice Act, as I mentioned, that was the first uh, Republican introduced carbon pricing proposal in a decade or so. Um, we have a couple of uh, bipartisan bills out there, um, and we've got the Climate Leadership Council, which is Republican-focused as well. So there, there is uh, a shift, I think, on that side, um, and uh, you know, th there's reason to be hopeful there. So I, I am completely sympathetic to the idea that that, that we should be skeptical, uh, particularly given you know the past history that that. This is going to happen anytime soon. I mean, it's it's absolutely true that that there are a couple of Republicans stepping forward, but literally a couple in, in Congress right now. Um, but to me, I guess the right question to ask isn't necessarily is this likely to happen, but is there another approach that's more likely to happen? Um, and in a divided country that we live in, I'm not I'm I'm just not sure there is. I'm glad people are trying all sorts of different approaches, though. Um, I guess while I'm talking. The, the point about global action, I think, is important, too. Um, I guess the way I see this, I'm curious what you guys think, but um, certainly the United States you know, can't, can't do anything alone. But uh, to me, it's kind of a necessary uh, step to any sort of meaningful global action. I, I kind of know the world isn't going to take strong action on this issue if the United States doesn't. Um, and there's certain things we can do, like put in place a border carbon adjustment that um, you know, taxes, uh, imports, uh, we can sort of develop technologies that we can um, help other countries decarbonize with. Uh, so I don't think we're powerless, um, and I think uh, just from a national leadership perspective, it's probably necessary. 
So on the global pollution I, uh, problem ish aspect, absolutely right. The U.S. is the richest country in the world. If we don't act, why would other countries act? And moreover, the power of innovation is going to be, ex and, and innovation driven by price is extraordinarily important. Uh, and so even if a carbon tax in this country has, uh, doesn't have a huge effect on global emissions, it could have a huge effect on innovation and development of new technologies that then can help bring down global emissions. On, on your question on cap and trade, which is really what you're asking, why don't we just do cap and trade? Because that's what you're talking about. Um, it's a cap with giving allowances and then, is, is, am I misunderstanding your question? Well, let me make an objection to cap and trade. I thought that's what you described. No, I said government auction of permits, which is different. That means that everyone who wants a permit has to buy. A cap and trade really benefits those who have not been carbon efficient in the past. No, okay, so, so let me just cut in because a cap and trade program, as the way it's been done previously, gave the, those permits away, often on the basis of historic emissions, which, which is what you're thinking about. But you can easily auction them. You could sell the permits to anyone who wants to buy them and then allow the trading. So the cap and trade aspect is not really driven by how those allowances are, are distributed. Auctioning, in fact, that's where the EU is going in that system. The real problem with cap and trade is that it's extraordinarily expensive from an administrative point of view. You have to develop an entirely new administrative structure to run the thing, whereas with a tax, you just piggyback on existing fossil fuel taxes, of which we have on coal, oil, uh, and some states on natural gas. The other problem is you have the price volatility, which then requires you to put in these mechanisms like price collars uh, at the ceiling or bottom. And if you hit the top or bottom of that range, you've effectively created a carbon tax. So why not just do a carbon tax? So I think for a lot of sort of practical reasons, there's also cyber crime issues, as we saw with the EU EPS. There are a lot of practical reasons why it's just more straightforward to go with the, with the carbon fee or carbon tax approach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to come into defense on <laughs> cap and trade just for a second here. Um, so, uh, so I think that there are, I think there's multiple ways to get at this issue. Cap and trade is one of them. Attacks with these kinds of climate backstops is another. Um, I will say that um, from our perspective, the most important thing is the limit on emissions, as I've said earlier. And I do think that cap and trade is a very straightforward way to achieve that. You have a set number of permits. You have that decline over time. You guarantee the environmental outcome. That is the main benefit from our perspective of cap and trade. Um, and I will say that these programs, where they exist in the US, California, for example, in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, they do auction a, a number of, not all, but a good portion of the allowances there. Um, and in California, for example, that, that program has helped along with lots of other programs in California, but um, they are way ahead of schedule. Uh, they've you know, lowered their emissions. They're be, they're, they've exceeded their targets um, ahead of schedule. Um, and so, a, and at lower cost than initially expected. So it's been a very successful program there. So I'm only checking my phone because we're getting Twitter questions. So let, let me throw a couple from our, from our online audience. Um, one question says, can you compare the risks of setting carbon prices too, lo too high versus too low? Um, another question is, what do we think about simultaneously imposing a carbon tax and al also offering tax breaks to clean energy firms? Any thoughts on either of those? So I guess models could help you think through uh, what are the losses from setting the tax too low versus too high. Uh, there's no, there's no, I don't think there's any clear, I'd have to think about that. I'm, I'm not sure how, uh, uh, whether the, the there's a Pascal's theory. wager doesn't come into play? For, uh, uh, I have to think about that. Yeah. Um, uh, and th the other question was on, what was the other question? The other question is um, simultaneously setting taxes and, 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 and also ah, offering right. tax breaks. So, so there I think um, a lot of the clean energy subsidies you could get rid of because the whole point of the subsidy is to lower, if clean energy is more expensive than, than dirty energy, uh, we want to lower that price to bring them into alignment. 
We want to align them so we can either lower the clean energy price or we can raise the dirty energy price. And with the carbon tax raising the price of dirty energy, you don't need the subsidies. So it, it really is sort of a bonus in that you can save some money on clean energy subsidies. That's my view. But make sure if you're going to do that, let's make sure we also get rid of the tax breaks for fossil fuels as well. And, and I'm actually going to disagree with that slightly because I, th I think it really depends on the technology that you're talking about, and, and in particular, sort of the maturity of the technology. Um, I think once you have clean technologies that are able to compete on a level playing field with fossil fuels, um, I would agree with that. Uh, but I also think that early on in their development, um, we actually do need quite a bit of government support uh, for these clean energy technologies. So uh, I think that includes sort of early stage research and development. Uh, it includes sort of demonstration projects. Like no nobody's going to go build nu first of their kind nuclear plants or, or um, you know, carbon capture and storage plants. Um, I'll give a shout out to my, my colleague Julio Friedman in the audience here who says, um, What's your magic number, Julio? Four. N equals four, Julio says. Before, before you get to four, the private sector really isn't going to take those risks. Um, I'll let him defend this specific number. But I think all this goes to show, uh, in my view, I think, I think you do need, um, or at least it's not necessarily inefficient, um, to, to, to support clean technologies until they're on a, a level playing field. So that's a fair amendment because we have really have two problems. We have a, we have a pollution problem and we have, we have a, an R&D problem. Uh, so that, that's, that's absolutely right. A couple more questions from the audience. How about we go right, right up front, uh, these two right here. And we'll go back over here. Thank you for this. My name is Gan Hablil. I'm a graduate student at the School of Engineering. And uh, I appreciate your time and sharing your insights. I'm curious to know, what are the um, potentially unforeseen implications of uh, taxing carbon? Because not to say that this is an analog, but if we look at the tobacco industry, for example, most of tobacco is taxed in the United States. And um, some potential implications are the development of industries like uh, vaping or things that mitigate some harm but create others. Is there something similar that can um, potentially happen when carbon is taxed? Thank you. And let's take one other question. Hi, Peter Burgess. Um, th th this is a huge problem, and it's, a, it's been around for 40 years, and we haven't moved yet. And it bugs the hell out of me bluntly. Um, the, the thing that bothers me more than anything else is that America's pollution has flooded the South Pacific Islands, and we don't give a damn. And the economic um, strategy of the United States, uh, you know, over the last 40 years or more, um, is, of course, now being applied in China and India. Um, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere as we speak ha that has come from the United States is way more than has come from China and India at this point. But, you know, so m the, 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 the remark a moment ago about, you know, sort of a, n we've got to get money out, you know, we've, we've got to use money and market and tax and to incentivize massive change, but, but, but fast, and I, I, I'm scared stiff of the description you guys have, have actually been do giving about the, the political impasse. So um, what's the, and is, can I ask you to jump ahead to your question just so we get other well, people involved here too? How do we get, a, you know, how much is it gonna cost to move, move the population of Houston to where it's safe? When I did the back, uh, you know, I, I came up with more like a $5,000 a ton tax to pay for what we need to fix. You know, I think the, the numbering is, is so wrong at the moment. Uh, the numbers are elegant, but I think they're wrong. Uh, sorry about that. No, thank, thank you for the question. Um, either of you want to jump in? Um, I guess I, <laughs> on the first question, um, I'd go to... Gibbs point from earlier, which is that you, you really can't avoid setting a carbon price, right? Whether you're setting it zero or some other number, 
Um, and you know, I, I think it's not like you're doing something or doing nothing. We're, we're doing something right now. We're not we're not taxing carbon. So I, I'm not um, just like I would. You know, I, I personally I think taxing tobacco and seeing the resulting drop in cigarette use was probably a good thing, even if there was these other unintended consequences. I I wouldn't rule it out for pricing carbon, but um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's an inhibitor to action by any means. Well, I think there is an analog to vaping, uh, and, and, and it is that if we were to do a strong carbon price in this country that, re that reduced our fossil fuels, the, the sort of the vaping analog, if you will, or the unintended consequences is that we increase our exports of fossil fuels to other countries so they still get burned, and they're burned in dirtier plants that are less efficient, so we're actually getting more emissions per BTU of energy as well as local pollutant uh, pollution. So I think the answer to that, and I think everyone understands this is a potential uh, consequence with unilateral policy, is that you have to, that you have to move on multiple fronts of both of, of, of pushing for strong domestic policy while also pushing to make sure that we're not simply going to move the emissions into other countries around the world through the international efforts. And I might just add one, one thing to that. This isn't so much unforeseen consequences, but just sort of a reminder that we need to be working on multiple fronts, even as we, even if we're able to pass ambitious climate policy, we need to be paying attention to um, sort of the specific impl implications of the different clean energy technologies that that might incentivize. So, for example, um, you know, if, if we are looking at, uh, you know, natural gas, we need to be thinking about the methane implications of that and making sure that we're um, reducing methane leaks across the supply chain if we're using more natural gas and coal, for example. With car carbon capture and storage, we need to be making sure that the carbon that's stored is permanent and secure. Um, so there's, you know, lots of other, there's lots of places where we need to be making sure that the clean energy technologies that are deployed are going to be uh, pointing in the right direction and other policies are going to be necessary to make sure that happens alongside the price that's incentivizing them. A couple other questions from this side of the room. Looks like these, we can, we can get these two. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriel Avgerinos, Energy Mentors and NYU. I want to ask a question that's semi-political, but also starts from the recent past, even though it's not a predictor of the future. And the analog is the clean power plan and what has been going on for the last two years in terms of repealing policies and regulations. So the part one of the question is, how fast do you think, starting in 2021, we can go back to where we were with everything that has been repealed and destroyed uh, in the last two years, number one. And number two, have we started, when you're talking about carbon tax, taking it not just to the what has been destroyed point of cost evaluation, but something that I have seen very much for power generation, and that is health care costs, connecting it to health care costs. I've seen papers and presentations that actually have a cents per kilowatt hour additional, um, if you want to call it health cost, to coal power generation. So is there, is that also another way of getting to specific realistic numbers of a carbon price or a carbon tax? Thank you. And why don't we take your question too? Thank you for a great presentation. First, a couple of questions. Uh, what Can you is talk into the mic? Sorry, it's, it's uh, hard to hear you. What is the, uh, in an ideal uh, design uh, of a carbon tax, what is the right uh, point of implementation or regulation? I mean, the upstream or the downstream, it should be applied, and also it should be uh, economy-wide or sector-specific, what you think about it. And uh, secondly, what is the best way to recycle revenue for a U.S., uh, I mean, uh, ideally? Uh, is there any empirical study or research about it that you made? and? And for a question for uh, Mr. Metcalf, uh, he said that the problem of uh, cap and trade system is an administrative cost. Uh, I guess it's an establishing an MRV system, I guess. Uh, if it is, uh, is, don't you think this should uh, be a must have rather than it's an optional one? I mean, 
uh, for a US, it should be must have. Uh, a developing country can say that it's a cost issue, then we can choose the carbon tax rather than the uh, emission trading. But uh, don't you think US should uh, establish this? Thank you. So, so uh, I'll mainly respond to a lot of your questions because they're, they're, they're squarely in, in, uh, discussed in my book. But I'll just mention, in terms of the health costs, the National Academy of Sciences did a study a number of years ago, I was on the committee for that, called the Hidden Costs of Energy. It actually did uh, uh, measure the incremental cost of, of electricity from different types of power plants, not only just from different coal-fired power plants, but coal-fired power plants looking at all of them and, and coming up with different estimates. So there are people doing that kind of work. Um, in terms of where to implement it, I think, you know, for, uh, uh, I think sort of, there are clear ways to do it for coal. You can do it at Mine Mouth, uh, for uh, petroleum product projects, uh, products at the refinery, for natural gas at distribution points or, or power plants. Uh, you want a broad-based system. Um, there's lots of work that's been done looking at the distributional implications of various revenue recycling schemes. So there's a lot of work that looks at that. And in terms of MRV, um, you need MRV, you need, ver you need you MRV need define, monitoring, define MRV. Uh, reporting, verification to know that there's not cheating going on. You need that with a tax system or a cap and trade. But, it, but the nice thing about uh, taxing the carbon emissions from fossil fuel combustion, we really track uh, uh, fossil fuel consumption, certainly in this country and in other major countries. So that's not a significant problem uh, to, to my mind. I don't know if others have different views. Um, I, I'll take maybe the, the first question on uh, sort of rollbacks under this administration and where we're going to be uh, in 2021. Um, I think it's actually, <laughs> what's actually interesting is that the Trump administration while they've been attacking everything across the spectrum on environmental rules, they've actually been relatively unsuccessful in the courts um, at formally rolling back the regulations that they've been trying to roll back. Um, that's in part because uh, the Clean Air Act, the foundations under which these rules are built, uh, is very strong under the Clean Air Act, um, but also uh, due to um, incompetence from the administration. Um, but uh, I will say on the CPP, um, one of the sort of good news stories. Clean power plan. The clean power plan, sorry, is that um, we, the electricity sector has actually made a lot of progress towards meeting the goals that were embedded in the clean power plan. Um, there's a lot more that we need to be doing, obviously, um, but we're perhaps in that sector not quite as behind as one would think. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that's something that um, I can share later if, if that's of interest. Uh, well, I mean, some of them, certainly some states are making more progress than others. Absolutely, that's true. Um, and, uh, and, and again, like there's, there's a lot more of bending the curve downward that we need to be doing, but um, there is also a lot of progress that's been happening in that sector. Lower renewables costs and, um, uh, you know, lots of, lots of progress. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions in the room or even online, but we are out of time. So I um, just want to thank you all again for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. Uh, our next event is going to be tomorrow, September 18th. Uh, this marks the release of a new book, A Guide to Chinese Climate Policy, written by David Sandelow, who was CJEP's inaugural fellow. Uh, it's in this building, I think in this room, actually, at 6 p.m., and also live, stream live streamed if you can't attend in person. For a full calendar of events, visit CJEP's website online. We hope to see you again soon, and please join me in thanking our guest speakers again uh, for coming tonight.